India's Mumbai Ahmedabad high speed rail corridor has consumed a full decade without completion. In October of last year, facing mounting delays and escalating costs, New Delhi reopened the bidding process and specifically invited Chinese firms to participate. Beijing's response was unequivocal. No. Most other nations with high-speed rail expertise showed equally little interest in touching the troubled project. With China out of the picture, India pivoted back to its original partner. This March, Indian officials announced they were considering Japan's next-generation Shinkansen, the E-10 series, to finally complete the stalled railway. The plan calls for purchasing 10 24-car train sets, with domestic manufacturing requirements built into the contract to align with India's industrial policy goals. Partial operations are targeted for 2027. There's just one problem. Japan's E-10 series exists primarily on paper. The trains haven't entered testing phases, let alone commercial production. So what does this reveal about India's infrastructure ambitions? Back in 2012, India unveiled its Diamond Quadrilateral Development Blueprint, an ambitious scheme to link major metropolitan centers like Delhi and Mumbai through high-speed rail networks. Initial projections estimated construction costs at 1 trillion rupees for a 508-kilometer line connecting 12 stations. If realized, the project would deliver India's first genuine high-speed railway, slashing travel time between Mumbai and Ahmedabad from over six hours to approximately two. New Delhi issued a global tender, inviting railway technology leaders worldwide to submit proposals. China, at that moment emerging as a formidable player in high-speed rail development, saw the Indian project as a strategic opportunity to demonstrate its capabilities on the international stage. In 2013, Beijing and New Delhi signed a Memorandum of Understanding on High-Speed Rail Technology Transfer, and preliminary planning work commenced for the railway's construction. Then Japan entered the picture. Despite being the acknowledged global leader in high-speed rail technology at the time, Tokyo made an offer India found impossible to refuse. A concessional loan package worth $33.5 billion with an annual interest rate of just 0.1%, translating to merely $137 in yearly interest payments on the entire sum. Faced with these extraordinarily favorable financial terms, India approved Japan's bid in 2015 to construct the Mumbai Ahmedabad Corridor, incorporating Japan's advanced 320 km per hour Shinkansen technology. Total project costs were estimated to exceed $14 billion. India's central government committed approximately $1.15 billion, with the state governments of Gujarat and Maharashtra each contributing $570 million. The remaining 80% would be financed through the ultra-low interest Japanese loan. The Mumbai Ahmedabad High Speed Railway officially launched in 2017, with completion scheduled for 2022. But the complexities of India's land acquisition procedures immediately created obstacles. Actual construction didn't begin until 2021, and progress was agonizingly slow. Project engineers reported that by 2022, only about 30% of the required land had been acquired, and barely 10 kilometers of track had been laid. It wasn't until early 2023 that land procurement finally concluded allowing construction to accelerate into what officials described as an intensive phase. Yet even with the land issues resolved, the project's completion rate stood at merely 25.6% by 2024. This sluggish progress sparked protests among Indian citizens and became an international embarrassment. Under mounting pressure, Japanese officials suggested India might consider bringing in other countries to take over portions of the work. By the end of 2024, India reopened bidding, and the project's estimated value had ballooned to $100 billion. New Delhi explicitly expressed hope that Chinese companies would participate in the tender. The implication was clear. If China agreed to join, the contract would essentially be theirs. Yet Beijing declined without hesitation, and remarkably, virtually no other country with high-speed rail expertise showed interest either.
So, the explanation actually lies in India's approach to contract negotiations. Since the Shinkansen project got underway, Indian firms and government officials have used a variety of tactics to pressure Japanese contractors into accepting, well, increasingly unfavorable terms. At first, India agreed to buy 24 train sets for $9.6 billion. Through persistent negotiation, though, Indian officials managed to push the price down to $8 billion. But honestly, the demands didn't end there. India insisted that Japanese manufacturers set up production facilities on Indian soil, threatening to withhold full payment otherwise, and even requested an additional interest-free loan of $2.1 billion just for factory construction. Beyond all that, New Delhi also demanded that the contracting nation provide financing covering 80% of the total order value. So, if a country accepted these conditions, India would only need to provide 20% of the project's funding, while foreign partners would absorb the remaining 80% of costs. These terms help explain not only China's reluctance to participate, but also why Japan has been quietly looking for ways to exit a contract it already signed. There's another crucial factor here. India's retroactive taxation policy, which was implemented before 2021. This legal framework actually allows the government to apply newly enacted tax laws retroactively to past periods, enabling authorities to levy penalties on companies for activities that were legal when they happened. In practice, this means that virtually any foreign company operating in India faces unpredictable tax liability, which can be imposed at the government's discretion. Combined with those unfavorable contract terms, China's decision to reject the $100 billion project becomes, well, entirely understandable. With China out and other nations just not interested, India's only remaining option was Japan, the original contractor still bound by the signed agreement. Neither side really wants to take responsibility for the project's failure. As of now, overall construction has reached 44% completion. Out of the 508-kilometer route, 183 kilometers of elevated structures and 313 kilometers of bridge foundations have been finished. In March 2025, the Indian government announced it was considering incorporating Japan's next-generation E-10 series Shinkansen trains into the project, potentially deploying them first on completed sections of track. The plan involves purchasing 10 24-car train sets with requirements that some units be manufactured domestically under India's industrial revitalization policies. New Delhi hopes this next-generation Japanese technology will finally push the Mumbai Ahmedabad project toward completion. The E-10 series maintains a maximum operational speed of 320 km per hour, no faster than current Shinkansen models. The trains feature 10 cars in standard configuration. Key innovations include a cargo loading door on the fifth carriage designed to facilitate freight handling and improve logistical flexibility at stations along the route. The E-10 also incorporates technology validated through Japan's Alpha X experimental platform, including L-shaped guide mechanisms to prevent derailment during seismic events, lateral shock absorbers to reduce braking distances and systems that dampen vibrations during earthquakes to minimize damage and derailment risk. These features represent Japan's most advanced high-speed rail technology to date. Here's the problem. The E-10 Shinkansen is a next-generation platform developed by JR East that hasn't entered commercial service anywhere. When India's railway ministry announced plans to purchase E-10 series trains, JR East engineers were still conducting tests at facilities outside Tokyo. The model is scheduled for deployment on Japan's Tohoku Shinkansen line in 2030 and hasn't even completed simulation testing for hot, dusty environments like those found in India. Yet India wants to leapfrog this entire development timeline, requiring Hitachi and Kawasaki Heavy Industries to deliver India Special Edition trains by 2027 with 50% local production. It's kind of akin to asking an apprentice who just learned to assemble bicycles to build a spacecraft. The technical challenges are, honestly, formidable.
The E10 series must be adapted to India's 2x25 kV power supply system, but even the existing test sections reveal infrastructure problems. Power poles have tilt errors of 15%, creating compatibility concerns. The E10 Shinkansen remains in what industry observers call the PowerPoint stage, conceptual rather than operational. Whether it can be manufactured on schedule, whether its performance will meet specifications, and whether it can integrate with India's existing infrastructure remain open questions. If successful, trains produced by India's BEML could potentially substitute for Japanese-built Shinkansen units. If problems emerge, India's high-speed rail ambitions face indefinite postponement. Some analysts suggest India's decision to skip the proven E5 series Shinkansen in favor of the unreleased E10 represents a calculated political maneuver by the Modi government. By promoting cutting-edge technology that doesn't yet exist in mass production, officials can, you know, deflect attention from current failures. Following the 2024 general election, Japan's 0.1% ultra-low interest loan arrangement drew public criticism, and the project became a political liability. The pivot to the E10 series functions as a technical smokescreen, using future technology concepts to obscure present-day setbacks. Meanwhile, China's CR450 electric multiple unit has achieved test runs at 450 km per hour, making it the world's fastest high-speed train. Research teams are conducting comprehensive scientific testing and performance validation, working toward commercial deployment. Development of the CR450 involved extensive foundational research, with all testing expected to conclude within two years. This progress, honestly, demonstrates China's high-speed rail technology advancing toward even higher speeds and greater efficiency. Indonesia's Jakarta-Bandung High-Speed Railway offers an instructive comparison. Completed in five years, the project exemplifies what some call an infrastructure miracle. Had India chosen to partner with China and adopted a model based on comprehensive industrial chain integration and localized training programs, the two-hour commuting corridor between Mumbai and Ahmedabad might already be operational today. Instead, Indian engineers continue wrestling with compatibility issues between European train control system level 2 and Japan's leaky feeder cable signaling systems. While Chinese technical standards have already secured high-speed rail technology agreements with six Southeast Asian nations, the Mumbai Ahmedabad saga reveals more than just infrastructure challenges. It exposes the gap between ambitious national visions and the grinding realities of execution, the distance between glossy presentations and functional railways. India's insistence on leveraging its massive market to extract maximum concessions from foreign partners has left it isolated, unable to attract the expertise needed to complete even partially finished projects. Japan finds itself trapped in a contract that has become financially and politically untenable, promising technology that doesn't yet exist to meet deadlines that have already passed. China's refusal to participate wasn't simply about unfavorable terms. It reflected a strategic calculation that some partnerships, regardless of their nominal value, carry risks that outweigh potential rewards. For Beijing, the lesson of the Mumbai Ahmedabad project is clear. Infrastructure development requires not just technology and financing, but stable governance, realistic planning, and partners committed to implementation rather than endless renegotiation. As the E-10 trains remain on drawing boards in Tokyo and construction crews in Gujarat work on infrastructure that may never carry operational trains at designed speeds, one question lingers. How many more years will pass before passengers can actually board a high-speed train traveling between Mumbai and Ahmedabad? The answer depends less on technology than on whether India can bridge the chasm between its infrastructure aspirations and its capacity to deliver them. Until then, the project stands as a monument to ambition, unmatched by execution. A railway to nowhere, built on promises that reality has yet to fulfill.